It's a pleasure to be with you again. My name is Jason Dexter. Today we are continuing our study of the book of Daniel, and we will study the first half of Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. In this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar has his famous dream. We will see that he has the dream of the statue with the golden head. But what does that dream have to do with us today? Well, we're going to look at two practical questions that also deals with how we react to things in our everyday life. First of all, when you need wisdom, where do you go? When you have a problem to solve, where do you go for guidance and for help? What should we do when we encounter difficulties? That's the first question. And the second question is when everything seems to be collapsing around us, our life, our situation, everything seems to be getting into chaos, into turmoil, everything seems to be falling apart. What do we do? How do we React. Those are two questions that we're going to look at today in the study of Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. So I will read through this passage. We will read it in three parts. The first part is Daniel 2, verse 1, which tells us the setting, which is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The second part is verses 2 through 12, which is the jostling of Nebuchadnezzar's so called wise men. And the third part is when Daniel makes his entrance onto the scene. Daniel 2, 13 through 18 shows how he responds to this situation. So let's read first verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. So this is the setting for this chapter. He has a restless night filled with with dreams. Now, first, you can see that the dreams come first, and then after the dreams, it says that his spirit was troubled. Okay, so it seems that his spirit was troubled because of the dreams that he had. Uh, I'm sure you can identify with being woken up in the night through some bad dreams. However, this wasn't just a usual bad dream or a nightmare. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar would have had those before as well. But this dream was so peculiar, so even supernatural in nature, that Nebuchadnezzar didn't know how to react to it. He couldn't go back to sleep. It bothered him. And so it was clearly meant to convey a message to him, but he couldn't understand it. And so we see that that curiosity will drive him to reach out to experts who could help decipher this puzzle. So we see that when Nebuchadnezzar wanted a problem solved, what will he do? He will go to his country's wise men or wise people. So let's go on and see as he does that from verses 2 through 12, which I will read first. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, that's all the wise people of the kingdom, be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the first question we wanted to look at today is when we face a problem, a difficulty in our life, where do we go to for help? Where do we go to for guidance and for wisdom? 
Well, for Nebuchadnezzar, he reached out to the experts in the world around him. He did not understand the meaning of the dream, and that really bothered him. So he was desperate, and in desperate times, he turned to the only source of help he could find. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was very familiar with the political maneuvering. He knew their deception and trickery. From the text, it's clear he also didn't fully trust them, and he didn't trust that they would give the correct interpretation. Perhaps he thought that they would give some vague story that sounded good and would be difficult to disprove. So there's a question there. If Nebuchadnezzar didn't fully trust them, and it's clear from the text that he did not, why did he still rely on them? And that's a very sad answer, actually, and it's because that he thought he had nowhere else to turn. He lived in a culture that was in the dark. False gods were worshipped in the form of idols. These were the religious leaders. These were the wisest people in his society. They were supposed to have the answers, but they were, in fact, as Jesus would later call the Pharisees, blind leaders of the blind. On some level, the king knew that they were a farce, that they were just selling a scam. But there seemed to be no other choice. These were the only people he could turn to. And that's a very sad state. So there's an application for us, and that is that we must turn to the right people for counsel. Society is filled with so-called experts who people tend to solicit help from. Psychologists and self-help gurus, authors, and all manner of counselors. If you walk into a bookstore in the United States, you will find so many books on almost any topic you, you want help on. If you want help on marriage, you can see rows and rows of help from people who will tell you they know the answer how to have a successful marriage. If you want help on raising children, you can find row after row after row of help on how to be successful. And many of the ideas in these books will actually be totally opposite. Some will tell you how to discipline your children effectively. Some will tell you you should never discipline your child. People will tell you, you know, let them free explore and learn. And others will tell you you need to have more structure. You can find every kind of idea that you want, many of which are contradictory. So we need to know where should we go for wisdom and for guidance to get the right answer. Because the person you ask will affect the answer that you get. And so we learn this throughout scripture, such as Proverbs 24, verse 6, for by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. So when you ask someone who is wise, you will get wise advice. Counsel is easy to get, but we need to get it from the right source. And we're reminded of that in Proverbs 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. The companion of fools will suffer harm. If you get your advice from the people around you, in the world, foolish people, then you will get foolish advice. Now, another place in Proverbs says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So if you ask an atheist or someone who's not a believer and a follower of Jesus for advice, you can know that the advice that you get will not fit in with the worldview of those who believe in and follow Jesus. If you ask an unbeliever for advice on a moral issue, know that it will come from a completely different world view. So this doesn't mean that we can never ask advice from an, someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. We could. For example, if I have a difficult math question, I can go to a math professor and he could give me good advice on how to solve this problem or what the answer is. But math is not really a moral issue. It's just a practical knowledge issue. But there are many areas in life we need wisdom. We need to go to the designer. God is the one who designed family and marriage and children and relationships and church and, and community. And all of these things are designed by God. So we need to go to the designer to get wisdom from him. That either means coming straight to his word or going to wise counselors who believe in him. So one simple application for you today is make sure you go to the right person for advice. As we go through this passage, we will see that the king 
came to the wrong people for advice and they really couldn't help him. Now, Nebuchadnezzar uh, did know how to deal with them. He first, in verse 3, told him that he had a dream. Okay, everything is normal. He says, I had a dream. My spirit's troubled to know the dream. And they answered in a very typically flattering way, O king, live forever. Tell us the dream. Tell us the dream and we will show the interpretation. Now, probably they'd had this kind of situation before where they, you know, give interpretations for dreams. But many times these kinds of fortune tellers or magicians, they're just experienced with how things work. So they can give some kind of vague answer about the future, about the people that you will meet or certain situations. And they can term it in such a way that's so vague that you can't really tell if it's, you know, when it's fulfilled or not. Or something happens and then you can kind of put it and fit it together into this so-called prophecy. But Nebuchadnezzar isn't going to fall for it. He says, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. So what is this? Basically, Nebuchadnezzar is giving them a test. He doesn't believe that they're going to give the real answer. And he wants to know the answer because he believes this dream is from God or at least a God. And so he says, I'm not going to tell you the contents of the dream. My test to see whether your interpretation is accurate is for you to tell me what I dreamt. And if you can do that, which is a miracle, then I will believe that the answer you give about the meaning of the dream will be the correct one. Who could know the contents of the dream? Only someone to whom God had directly communicated with them to give him this special knowledge could he know the contents of the dream. And so if God did that, then Nebuchadnezzar could assume they would know the meaning of the dream. Now, any 10-year-old can come up with an interpretation for a dream. And a wise one would put its events far enough into the future that it couldn't be tested or proven wrong. Now, we also see another characteristic of Nebuchadnezzar here and he will show it throughout the book of Daniel, is that he's a very wrathful person. He uses his power to threaten people to get what he wants. He says, if you don't give me what I want, I'll have you ripped and torn to shreds, and your houses themselves will also be laid in ruins. So he gives this extremely over-the-top threat to try to let them know he's really, really serious. But... He's, his threats are not idle threats. We will see later in the book he intends to use them. He threatened Daniel's friends later in the book and he did follow through. So he has power and he intends to use it. He's a man of fury and a man of wrath. But on the other hand, he wants to show them, look, I'm a nice guy too. I'm, I'm good and I care about you. So if you can come through and tell me what the dream means, then you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So he uses the carrot and the stick method. Look, if you don't do it, you get the stick, in this case, execution. If you do do it, then you get a great reward. We see here some of the hubris and the ego of Nebuchadnezzar that he could think through sheer threats and power, he can somehow make these people conjure up the dream that he had and know it and its interpretation. Completely absent from his thinking is actually seeking after God to find the meaning of the dream. Apparently this dream is from God, but he doesn't seek God at all. He thinks that through his own riches by offering reward or through his own power offering punishment that he can somehow force people to come up with this dream because he's used to being in charge. He's used to giving commands. He's used to pe telling people, go here and go there, and they, they will do whatever he says. And so he thinks that they can do that in this case as well. But the wise men tell him that this is impossible. They say in verse 7, you need to tell us the dream before we can tell you the interpretation. And so at this point, the king started to get very, very upset. He says, I know with certainty you're trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. Okay, so he moves up the timetable. He says, look, you guys are just wasting 
time. You're just trying to drag this out until the situation changes. So if you don't tell me the dream, then I'm going to have you all killed. So this is the kind of person that Daniel served under for many years. Nebuchadnezzar, who threatened people in order to get what he wanted. This was like playing with fire. One mistake serving in Nebuchadnezzar's court and you get burned. I wonder how many people he had executed. And But many people, why were they willing to do it? Either they were forced to do it or many did it because of the potential reward and the power that they could have by being close to such a powerful man. But we see the wise men and the sorcerers were unable to provide any true assistance at all. They failed to solve this riddle because they had no real power, authority, or divine wisdom. Much like the Egyptian magicians in the time of Moses, they played the game well. Magic tricks and deception and counterfeit were their tools, but their religions were false and they had no actual ability. We see that a similar thing occurred in the time of Moses. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So these magicians in the time of the Exodus were actually able to, on some small scale, replicate some of the miracles that Moses and Aaron did, such as turning their staffs to snakes, turning some water to blood, and making some frogs come out of the water. But did, did they do it through their own magic and trickery and deception? Or did they do it through... A, a demonic power. We don't know the answer, but they did not have the same power that God does. And so finally, they were forced to admit that they lost this. They played the game well, but they didn't have real power from God. And they could differentiate the two saying, this is the finger of God. So when put up against true miracles of God, worldly experts fortune tellers and prophets and soothsayers and all of these things are shown to be the frauds that they are. Clever words and illusion are their game. And it's a game they're good at, but it's still just a game. In the country I live in, there are many fortune tellers who try to calculate things about one's future based on numbers and things like this. But much of this is demonic. They are oftentimes channeling demons and then getting information and making these statements about people's life based on their connection to this dark magic or to this uh, to these demons. So the spiritual realm is real and does exist, but we need to be very, very careful about it. Jesus himself told us that these things exist. Matthew 24, 24, he says, False Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So there is an application for us here, and that is very simple. Be careful. Be discerning. Do not trust in every person who does something flashy or the appearance of some kind of miracle. We need to look at their actions. We need to look at their lifestyle. Now, most cultures have people something like the Babylonian wise men. For some, it's the medicine man, the witch doctor, the shaman, the fortune teller. Still more rely on religious leaders of false religions. And in more developed countries, though, it's counselors holding PhDs. What's the application? Instead of turning to this kind of people who admittedly cannot solve the problem, we must turn to the one true living God. He's our creator. He's our designer. He knows every hair on your head, exactly how many you have. He knows every problem you have ever faced, every problem you ever will face. He knows everything about you and he has the perfect solution for you. He's the one who enables ordinary and uneducated men like Peter and John to do supernatural miracles that no earthly man can achieve. So let's get into the habit of always turning to the Lord for help. Not just listening to our neighbors or our relatives or whoever is shouting the loudest to us about what we should do with our life. Obviously, we should be humble and listen to the opinions of others, but we need to be discerning and understand who is speaking truth and wisdom from God and who is speaking 
uh, through the world's ideology and through culture's ideology. So this is the wise man that Nebuchadnezzar depended on. And they weren't that wise after all. When he found out that they couldn't give the answer, then he gave the command in verse 12. He became very furious. He gets angry a lot in the book of Daniel and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So that brings us to verse 13 and when, where Daniel makes his appearance in this story. Let's read verses 13 through 18. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So here we're going to see quite the contrast between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Now remember that at this point, Daniel is a youth. He's probably not yet 20 years old, more likely around 18 years old or so. But let's look at the wisdom with which he responds to this situation. And also looking at that, coming back to the question we asked at the beginning of this lesson, and that is when everything collapses around us, when all of our life seems to be falling apart and going into chaos, what should we do? And we can learn that from Daniel. Because Daniel is just going about his business. We don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was eating a meal or reading a book or writing something or, or just walking along the street. Whatever he was doing, suddenly these guards came up, says, you're under arrest. What's going on? Well, you're going to be executed. What? For what? Because of the king's order. All the wise men are going to be executed. Wow. What a surprise. And this sudden disaster comes upon Daniel who had already been through a lot. He was in exile in a foreign country. He and his friends were alone in this foreign country, away from their families. And now they're about to be killed. But how does Daniel respond? Verse 14 is so beautiful. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch. Throughout the whole process, we can see that Daniel was calm and careful. He was never hasty. He didn't ask, act rashly. He didn't speak before thinking. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't panic. He didn't get nervous. He remained cool, calm, collected. Panicking or acting rashly is never helpful and will typically make the situation much worse. So there's a simple application for us here. Act, don't react. Rather than rashly reacting to a situation, Daniel took the initiative to understand it and to find out a solution. So what did this prudence and discretion lead him to do? Well, first he asked a question, verse 15. He says, why is the decree of the king so urgent? So the first thing Daniel does is ask a question. He didn't just hear part of the story and then act. He says, look, I need to get the full picture. I need to understand everything that's going on before I can decide how I need to react in this situation. He asked and then he listened so that he could understand the whole picture. And that reminds us of an important principle from Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. In other words, we shouldn't be too quick to offer our opinion to give our decision or our conclusion to something until we know all of the facts. So it's very important to get all of the facts about a situation before we jump in to offer a solution. When people come to you for counsel or to ask your opinion on things, 
then make sure don't say, oh, they're asking my counsel. Wow, great opportunity. You should do this and this and this. First, slow down. Ask more questions. Fully understand the situation and take your time to give a prudent reply. In the book of Proverbs, it often talks about fools who are talking too quickly. There are a lot of practical ways which you can do that. For example, if a husband comes home hours late, his wife might say, you don't care about the nice meal I made and you're always late. You always put your work first. Acting with some assumption about her husband being late. Wouldn't it be better for her to ask a question? And not even a loaded question like, why are you home late again? What about a better question? What could be a better question? Is everything okay? Or were you delayed? Ask a neutral, open-ended question to better understand the situation. We oftentimes make things worse when we make assumptions about what has happened and we jump on people in judgment before we fully understand the facts. So in almost every area of life, neutral fact-finding questions can help you understand the whole story. We don't want to act on assumption. Now it's important to note Daniel, he already had a good relationship with Ariok. He had earned Ariok's respect over a period of time. And so because of this relationship, which Daniel had already formed, then Ariok was more willing to talk to him and to answer this question. Now, notice again after Daniel hears it. So first, Ariok answered his question. He made the matter known to Daniel. And then it says, Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time. So he first asked permission. He graciously requested the king for more time. Now, first, he obviously must have asked Ariok as well for a meeting with the king. And Ariok agreed to it. Now, this also shows a lot of faith by Daniel because Daniel didn't yet have the interpretation or the dream. But Daniel believed that this must be from God and that God would give him an answer. So first, he went into the king and he asked for basically a stay. Please don't execute anybody yet until you give me a chance to come to God and to see if God will tell me the answer. He says, because this is your, this is your goal, right? You want to know the interpretation. So... Give some time and I will see if God will tell me the interpretation. So we see again, Daniel is very calm. He's very rational. He's very wise in how he deals with this situation. Then notice the next step. Daniel doesn't do it alone. He made the matter known to his friends. So Daniel was not some kind of a lone ranger. He wasn't prideful. He wasn't just going to use the situation to try to seek after his own glory. And Okay, this is my chance to get a promotion and I'm going to get all the credit for myself. Neither did he place confidence in his own gifting of interpretation or he, he had many dreams and visions and things in the book of Daniel, but he doesn't get cocky. He doesn't just presume that God is going to tell him this. Instead, he surrounds himself with a team. And we see here the importance of team, sharing with them the details of the situation. And they, in turn, could help him share the load. And notice what Daniel asked of them. He told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. In other words, let's have a prayer meeting. I'm going to be praying, and I need you guys to help me and to pray for me. So look at the difference between what Nebuchadnezzar and what Daniel do when confronted with a problem. Nebuchadnezzar acts rashly, in fury, threatening everybody, yelling at everybody, you need to tell me the dream or I'm going to kill you all. And he turns to his wise men for help. This is the king, the most powerful man in the world at this time. And this is how he reacts. Daniel, a 20-year-old or 18-year-old, very young youth, who is in exile and a captive in a foreign country, acts with a hundred times the wisdom and the patience that Nebuchadnezzar does. He calmly asks more questions to find the situation. He asks for permission for a day or however long delay, a stay. 
And then he he realized the importance of team. And so he turns to other godly believers for help. And together they turn to the Lord of heaven for help. So Daniel is the wise one, even though he's young, because he turns to the right place for help. So the question was, when we encounter difficulties in our life, when our life seems to be falling apart, where do we go? Where do we turn to? How do we react? Nebuchadnezzar threw, went into a rage and turned to the world for help. Daniel calmly went to the Lord for help. This is very, very important in showing us how to react when things around us go bad. And we learn there's strength in numbers. No matter how wise or intelligent we think we are, we need other believers for encouragement, counsel, and support as we seek the Lord together. So, when you face a difficult situation, remember you're not alone. Go to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Ask them to support you in prayer. Tell them about your struggles. Ask them to lift up their voices together with you so that together you can seek mercy from the King of Heaven. Many times our troubles compound because we try to face them alone just like George in It's a Wonderful Life. And all the things around him were collapsing, but he didn't turn to his family or his close friends. He tried to face it alone, and he became more and more depressed and discouraged. God's made us part of a larger spiritual family. Be quick to support others and equally willing to ask for help. So the two questions we asked at the beginning of the study today is where do we turn for help when we need it? And the answer is it should be to God and to wise counselors. And the second is how do we react when our life seems to be falling apart? And the answer is we should react calmly and go to the Lord in prayer and ask others to pray with us. If we do these things, then it will really help us to have a stable and a productive and a fruitful life as we build our life on the solid rock of Jesus rather than on the ever-changing fads and whims of this world and its culture. I hope this study was encouraging for you. In the next one, we will be studying the second half of Daniel chapter 2 as we see the conclusion of what is Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what is the interpretation and what does that mean for us today. Hope to see you then. Until then, God bless.